on, on the way, the truth, and the life. Can you give me a little, give me, give me a little more volume? <clears throat> so when I go brimstone, they'll hear it. I love that one. <sighs> so today I want to talk about the rule. <laughs> And every time we talk about rules, we're saying, oh, that's legalism. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, that's boring. No, the, hopefully this won't be boring. Y'all explain what the rule means. It might take me the whole message to get to the end, but we're going to talk about it. But let's go to our, our text. Let's go to Mark chapter 1, verse 16. How many are praying for me? How many are praying for your pastor? I'm still at 50%. As Jesus was walking along the shore of Lake Galilee, he noticed two brothers fishing, Simon and Andrew. He watched them as they were casting their nets into the sea and said to them, Come, follow me. He didn't even say repent. Because you can't follow without repenting. It's just given. Come, follow me, and I will Woo, transform you. It's from the Passion Translation. Transform you into men who catch people instead of fish. Immediately. And we talk about that, why they would do that. Immediately they dropped their nets and left everything, everything behind to follow Jesus. And we talk, just, just briefly, we talk about this because these guys are basically high school dropouts. <laughs> they, they, they would never be chosen, never be chosen, never, <laughs> by a rabbi. And here, the greatest rabbi of all comes along and says, follow me. When he said, follow me, that was the man, that was it, that was it, that was it. That's like winning the lottery. And that's why they dropped everything. That's why they're willing to do that, because this is, this is life-changing. Walking a little farther, Jesus found two other brothers. They weren't black, but they were brothers. I'm not getting anywhere this morning. Two other brothers sitting in a boat, along with their father, mending their nets. Their names were Jacob and John, and their father, Zebedee. Jesus immediately walked up to them and invited the two brothers to become his at once, say at once. Jacob and John dropped their nets. James and John stood up, left their father in the boat with the hired men. Daddy's expression was, <laughs> and followed Jesus. So again, I wanted to visit this scripture and, and, and just emphasize that, that, that Jesus is the way. He is the way, and we follow him. It, it's, 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 really three, it's really three steps. It's repent, believe or trust, and follow. Unfortunately, today, many churches are stuck on repent. And believe just means believe for your stuff. And follow's not even in the picture. We just got a lot of people that are forgiven, but not Christ-like. Forgiven, but still going their own way. So we need to, re and the word repent in the Greek simply means turn around. Go the other way. You can't go the way when you're going your way. Hello, hello, hello. So repent just means go the other way. Stop doing what you're doing. Stop going where you're going. Stop saying what you're saying and turn around and then trust him. When he says believe, he means believe in him. It's not so much about believing certain doctrines, though that's important, but he's saying, trust me, and then, wow, follow me. Last week we said it's not WWJD. It's what would Jesus do if he were you? I, I F, whatever. <laughs> 
it's impossible to figure out what Jesus would do because Jesus had a different, you know, Jesus is going to do different things than you. But if Jesus were you, if Jesus were on the phone with this crabby person, if Jesus were at work where you work, if Jesus went to school with you, what would he do? Put him in your life because he is the way, the way. Let me explain it like this. What if you're in a dark cave, cavernous cave, and you're lost, and it's dark, and you don't know the way out, and you're scared? You are lost. Amen? Somebody comes along and says, I know the way out. So you. When Jesus said, I am the way, he didn't just mean a step you take to go to heaven. He means, I know the way out of the cave. I know how to change your life so that you're not doing the things that are destroying you and and depressing you and hurting you, amen, and you will no longer be, it'll take some time, but I am the way. You can't get out of this situation unless I lead you out of this situation. I am the way. Follow me. He's offering an entirely different way of living, not just forgiveness. Wow. Wow. I like that. You know, Robert Frost, the poet, he, he wrote that poem so many years ago, The Road Less Traveled. And this is the road less traveled. I'm afraid there's a lot of Christians that aren't even traveling it. And you wonder sometimes if they are. That, that still haunts me where they said, Lord, Lord. And he said, I didn't know you. An ancient uh, Greek philosopher before Christ said this. I like this. He said, the way up is the same as the way down. Heraclitus said that. What does that mean? The way up, the way to Jesus, the way we get to God is through Jesus. But listen, the way God gets to us is through Jesus. The way up is the same as the way the way we get to him is the same way he gets to us. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The way is narrow. The way is difficult. The way is dangerous. I'm waiting to see if anyone's going to leave. But it's rewarding. But there is a cost. There is a cost. You're, you're going to kind of get some history lessons today. Are you okay? How many history buffs do we have here? All five of you. Okay. Let me scratch that out of my message. They are not interested. <laughs> In, in 1937, does anybody remember what's going on in 1937? Hitler on the rise. There was a Christian theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer who wrote a book entitled The Cost of Discipleship. The Cost of Discipleship. And he's in Nazi Germany. Not many people know this, unless you're a good student of history, but most, the majority of the churches in Germany sided with Hitler. They were okay with him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was not. He was not okay with Hitler, and he stood his ground on what is right because there's a cost to discipleship. In 1943, he was arrested. Two years later, just before the end of the war in 1945, they hung him. The cost of discipleship. How many know I think the cost is going up as we're in these last days? Did you know all except John of the apostles died as martyrs? It's interesting. The word for martyr is the same as the word for witness. (laughs) It's the same word. We know that James was beheaded. 
We know that Peter was crucified upside down in, in Rome. Uh, Mark was killed in Egypt after he was dragged by horses through the street. Luke was hung in Greece. Thomas was stabbed to death in India. Matthew, Matthew was impaled with a sword in Ethiopia. And we know Paul was probably beheaded in Rome. I like what Tertullian said, the theologian in just the second century after Jesus. He said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The more they killed them, the more the church grew. The more they killed them, the closer they got to Jesus. Until they actually felt it was an honor to die. There were people who died, who died natural deaths, who on their deathbed re regretted that they couldn't die a martyr. Boy, I tell you, we don't live in times like that. Now it's just hard to get people out of bed when it's snowing. But you're here. Praise God. Good crowd today. Look around. Man, best looking people I've ever seen. Y'all are good looking people. You are in Jesus. Okay. But so, so far, this is kind of a negative message. Oh, it's going to cost me. Oh, this is hard. Oh. But what you gain. is much more than what you have to give up. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew 13. Let's, let, let's go there. It's, now, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Okay, let's just go here. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like, wow, treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and then hid, reburied, and for joy over it, for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that, hold that scripture, and buys that field. Now, now we don't understand that. We don't, what's he doing? What, what people bearing all that? They didn't have banks back then. And if you had a little stash, the best thing to do, don't put it in the house because houses weren't that big. Somebody could break into the house, and your money would be gone. They would bury it somewhere on their property. And sometimes the people would die without telling anybody where their money's buried. Amen? So this guy comes along, and I don't know why he's snooping in this dead man's field. But somehow he comes, up, he comes upon a stash he, maybe it was a little bit out of the ground, and he stubbed his toe on it, and he starts digging, and there, there is more money than he's ever seen in all of his life. And he says, you know, I can't just take it. It's not my field. Listen, you can't take what, belong, what doesn't belong. Don't act like a Christian when you don't own it. So, they, so, they, so he buries it again. And he goes out and he says, I need to buy this field from this guy. I need to buy this from the family. But, but, but the thing is, it'll take everything I have. I'm going to have to sell my home. I'm going to have to quit my, I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to sell everything I have in order to buy this field. And probably nobody understood it. How many know a lot of people didn't understand it when you got saved? What are they doing? Oh, they're crazy. But, but, but he sells everything, and, and that's, now he has nothing because he buys the field, but he knows what's in the field. Whew. So we, we give up everything to follow Jesus, but we know what's involved with following Jesus. 
We know something that other people don't know. We know there's a treasure hidden in Jesus. Hallelujah. We know that, oh, my God, hallelujah, we, mm, because we heard about it. We know it's in that field, and we know where it's at. He buys the field, and he goes out and digs it up, and now, instead of having nothing, he's got it all. Next verse. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Because that one pearl, say one pearl, that one pearl was worth more than everything he had. Am I helping anybody this morning? I don't mind following Jesus. I don't mind the cost. I don't mind what I have to go through because I know what's in the field. I know what we gain. But listen, there are temptations along the way. Anybody ever face temptations? If you say no, it's because you got saved at the altar just a few minutes ago. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't get tempted on the way back to your seat. There are temptations. Even Jesus was tempted. As soon as John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Woo! And the Holy Ghost came down. And the Father's voice. By the way, good proof of a trinity. <laughs> There's Jesus and the Father and the Holy Ghost. All three are there at the same time. It's kind of hard to be Clark Kent Superman when you're throwing his voice. And Come here, Dove. He went, Will you fake the Holy Ghost for me? No, no, no. It's the Holy Ghost. It's the Father. It's the Son. And he said, this is my in whom I'm. By the way, what had he done so far? Nothing. Nothing. He was a carpenter's son. He made cabinets. But this is my beloved son. I'm telling you, Jesus loves you not because of what you have, but because of who he made you. This is a wonderful thought, but he will love you when you have nothing. He loves you when you have nothing to give and you own nothing. You could be out on the street a destitute, but Jesus loves you. No, maybe nobody cares about you, but I promise you, he made you in his image and he cares and knows about you. My God. Isn't God good? He goes into the desert, and, and the devil says, uh, you hungry? Why don't you turn these stones into bread? In other words, we're still doing that. In other words, hmm, hmm. let's use our powers. Let's use God to fill our bellies. Jesus fed people not for the miracle, he fed them because he had compassion. And that should be the only reason we pass out food. Is we're not, we have no motives in that other than we have compassion on those who are in need. Can I get an amen? But too many churches, they're, in fact, they just admit it, they, they're need-oriented. Find a need and fill it. I, I have heard that phrase for 30 years. When it first came out, find a need and fill it. Find a need and fill it. Yeah, yeah, I believe we should be ministering to the needs, but let's not manipulate people. If you're going to find a need and fill it, do it because you love them. Do it because you have compassion. Do not expect anything in return. The only people who really love other people are the people who do things for people that cannot give them anything back. Who don't think, what can I get out of it? Jesus said, no, thank you. I'm not turning stone into bread. Then he says, hey, let's have some excitement. Why don't you jump off this cliff? <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> jump off the cliff, and you know the angels will catch you. It'll be a big miracle, and my, oh, we'll buy a bus and travel the country. Miracles are not for your entertainment. 
But let me dig, let me deep down a little bit more. Neither is the music. Neither is even my preaching. We are not here to entertain you. And there are people, there are pastors who say, if we just had a miracle, if we just had someone bounce out of a wheelchair. Eh, 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 eh. Listen, it's not about thrills and spills. If there's a miracle, thank God for the miracle. Jesus loves them, and Jesus did it. Amen. But listen, we're not going to build church on miracles. Miracles happen when miracles happen. Jesus is, isn't into that. I, listen, I believe that. I don't believe Jesus, when he was working in the carpenter shop and he bent a nail, I don't believe he ever supernaturally straightened it. Right? Jesus wouldn't use his miraculous power to play games. He just loved people, so he cast out their demons. He loved people, so he healed them of their infirmity. It wasn't a game. He wasn't trying to build some big church. Most of those people never came around anyway. Come on. We're not here for the excitement. We're not here for escapism. We're not here for thrills. We're not here to do miracles just to impress people. Let the miracles happen. They will happen. Thank God they happen. But that's not what we're all about. I'm not jumping off the cliff for you. I'm not even jumping down these two stairs. If I survive that, even that would be a miracle. Amen. No, I could, I could, I could. Don't need a miracle for that. But then he said, look, look at it. Look, look, look. Took him on a high place. Look at all this. All this could be yours. You know what he was saying to Jesus? You could control it all. I can make you in charge so that you you can force people to be who you want them to be. All this could be yours. Listen, church isn't about controlling people. I hear pastors say, it's all about control, is it? And by the way, how's that working for you? I found out a long time ago, you sheep are not controllable. You kind of bye-bye wherever you want to go. <laughs> you see one going off, and 20 of you will follow them off. And, right? I can't control it. I tell pastors all the time, quit thinking you can control things. Just love them. Just, just bless them. Just pray for them. Just, just do what God tells you to do, and the rest will take care of itself. Jesus says, it is written. It is written. It is written. He, he applied the word of God. And he, listen, Jesus didn't need to control everything because it was all going to be his eventually anyway. But things had to play out. Things had to happen, right, until we get to the end of time. Am I making sense to anybody? Wow. The way is not about meeting needs necessarily. It's not just about excitement and thrills or taking over. We're going to take over the world. <laughs> yeah. It's about a community of followers who are trying to be with him, trying to be like him, and trying to do what he does. My God. Following Jesus transforms us. The world conforms us, Romans 12, 1, right? Present your bodies, which is your reasonable service. And then next verse, and be transformed, right? Be transformed. So we live by the way. Let me, let me put it this way. What if, what if you knew? What if you knew huh, that God was on a certain island somewhere? He was, he was there. How many of you would rent a boat? You'd go see him if you knew he was on a certain hill. He lived on that hill. I don't know about you. 
I'm, book, I'm getting my hiking boots on. I'm going to go there because I know he's there. Nowadays, we say silly things like, well, this is God's house. This is where he is. Well, we're only here for a little while each week. The rest of the week, he's pretty lonely. God's everywhere, but you know where he dwells. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You don't have to go to a mountaintop. You don't have to go to an island. He's not on some desert somewhere. He lives in you. You just need to get rid of the clutter. You just need to clean out the filters. You just need to practice the presence. Oh, my God. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter who likes you or who doesn't like you. It doesn't matter what your position in the church is. It doesn't matter if you go to church or you don't go to church. I'm, I mean, it, it does matter. But that's another story for another day. What I'm saying is what really matters is that he lives in you. And you can practice uh, the presence of him and you every day, every minute of your life. And he can walk with you and he can talk with you. Wow. Stand to your feet. Praise him. Hallelujah. Wow. We, this is how... We are transformed, not by the laying on of hands, but we are transformed by practicing his presence. Being a disciple, hello, hello, who 